Tonight, a win for girls in BC. Some people don't have a lot of extra money to be spending, and it's really great that it's coming to all the public schools. Schools in the province will soon provide free menstrual products. Why it's happening here, and who's pushing for it elsewhere. I think it's important for an employee of the states to be neutral. What Quebecers think about the plan to ban religious symbols for public workers. One small city weighs in on a big issue. That's the biggest mistake we're making right now, is not moving fast enough. We're going in the right direction, but we got to go faster. And with Canada warming at twice the rate of the global average, we look at the balance between fixing the problem and adapting to it. This is The National. For years, women across Canada have pushed lawmakers, reduce the cost of menstrual products, maybe even down to zero. It's not an easy fight, but today it was British Columbia that delivered the kind of change women have been asking for. And as Greg Rasmussen shows us, it's in public schools. The benefit will be felt in more than a few ways. All 60 school districts will be required to ensure free menstrual products are available in school washrooms. Half a million students across the province will now have guaranteed access to menstrual products in school washrooms. It's taken years. This mother helped get things rolling. When I found out that schools didn't have period product dispensers in the restrooms, I immediately purchased one for my daughter's school and installed it. Selena Tribe went on to convince her school board to provide free products. Then it snowballed. Periods are a normal part of life. There's something that we don't talk about, but they happen for five to seven days every month. Uh, they're unpredictable. According to a study by pad manufacturer Always, one in seven girls have missed school at some point because they couldn't afford to purchase menstrual products. Menstruation products are very expensive. 17-year-old Rebecca Ballard worked on the issue at her school. I think everyone should be on board with this, not even just this country, but pretty much every country in the world. Like, it's a necessity for every woman, like, and every person who menstruates. People, it's all over the world. It's not just in BC, it's not just in Canada. It's like a global thing. Advocates say universal access in all public bathrooms is the next step. Sometimes you're just caught and you get oh, yeah, off guard. <laughs> Outside of Vancouver High School, these teenagers say having free dispensers gives them one less thing to worry about. I think it's really important that all people have access to those things because some people don't have a lot of extra money to be spending and it's really great that it's coming to all the public schools. Now people maybe who when they're on their periods are more inclined to go to school because now they know that if they can't afford to have tampons and pads that their school is providing them. As for the price, BC's program will cost about one dollar per student per year. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. And there are several parts of the country also trying to take the issue on, tackling what's known as period poverty. Actually, it took the federal government eight years to remove the tax on, on feminine hygiene products. So uh, for us in London, it, it was just an overnight thing. Schools in London, Ontario began a pilot project last year, offering pads and tampons in their washrooms. And next week, city council votes on whether municipal washrooms should offer the same free of charge. Then over in Toronto, just last month, Council approved a similar pilot project in some of its city-owned buildings. And in Dartmouth, some pharmacies, including this one, are now giving out free menstrual products to women in need. For every product purchased, they'll give one away for free. Now, part of the issue is that the price of pads and tampons can actually be quite different depending on where you live. On average, for example, a Canadian might expect to pay around $64 annually. Over 30 years, that's about $2,000. But if you live in the north, those costs can almost double to about $118 annually, or more than $3,500 over three decades. Okay, Ian, you've got the latest on the political story that's occupied Canadians for weeks now. Andrew, for many people, the political turmoil over the SNC-Lavalin affair comes down to who you believe, the Prime Minister or his former Attorney General. Well, today, Jody Wilson-Raybould faced some tough questions on CBC Radio here in Vancouver. Our David Cochran was listening. Talking about our Marshall Jody Wilson-Raybould says she was pressured to interfere in the SNC-Lavalin case, but denies reports that she was seeking assurances that amounted to the very same thing. I have to say unequivocally that I would never interfere 
with the independence of uh, the Attorney General. So you did not seek an assurance that your replacement, David Lametti, would not overrule the Director of Public Prosecutions and Director to give SNC-Lavalin a deferred prosecution agreement? I would absolutely never do that. But even after her unequivocal denial, multiple liberal sources maintain Wilson-Raybould raised this condition during weeks of secret talks seeking a compromise. Uh, we've seen too many sources say she raised it directly with the prime minister in Vancouver in the days before she quit cabinet. It was discussed after she quit cabinet, but it was not part of the conversations in the final days leading up to her caucus expulsion. That's why. I made the difficult decision to remove Ms. Wilson-Raybould and Dr. Philpott from the Liberal caucus. During the discussions that preceded that moment, multiple sources say Wilson-Raybould had other conditions. They say she wanted Trudeau to fire his principal secretary, Gerald Butts, the clerk of the Privy Council, Michael Wernick, and PMO senior advisor, Matthew Bouchard, something she will neither confirm nor deny. Did you ask that Gerald Butts, Michael Wernick, and Matthew Bouchard be fired? Um, there was a number of conversations that was had, but those conversations came after um, January the 14th, after I was shuffled out as the Attorney General, and those conversations are still covered by confidence, and I respect the confidences that I had. David, another development in the story tonight, SNC-Lavalin has filed another court action. Yeah, that's right, Ian. The company has gone to the Federal Court of Appeal to try to force prosecutors to negotiate a de deferred prosecution agreement with it. And what we've learned from new court filings are the three specific reasons why they've been denied one so far. The first is the nature and gravity of the offenses. You have to remember these charges involve millions of dollars in fraud and bribery involving the former Gaddafi regime in Libya. The second is the involvement of senior officers in the organization. And the third is that fact that SNC-Lavalin did not self-report this alleged criminal behavior. Now, up to this point, prosecutors have not explicitly told us what their reasons were. Well, tonight, the company has filled in some of those blanks for us. All right, David, thank you. You're welcome. Turning now to Quebec and the opposition to Bill 21, it would ban certain public sector workers from wearing religious symbols and clothing like the hijab. Today, protesters at one Montreal high school said, no way. It's very discriminatory uh, and uh, very, my mind, very racist. I'm hurt and disappointed in our government because this is my home. Quebec is my home. But they weren't the only ones pushing back today. Members of Montreal's Jewish community also voiced concerns. Could you imagine a child growing up that wants to be a prosecutor or a judge or a policeman? No child should be denied the right to believe they can be anything. And this is a law that denies that. Premier Francois Legault hopes to have the legislation on the books by June. Now, while opposition is strong inside Montreal, leave the island and passions cool. Today, our Alison Northcott visited the home riding of the Quebec minister who spearheaded Bill 21 to see how people there see things. At his busy barber shop, about 40 kilometers from Montreal, Johannes Sandoval says banning religious symbols for some government employees makes sense to him. You have a specific religion. You, you're supposed to keep that for you. He moved to Quebec from the Dominican Republic at 14 and has watched the debate around secularism unfold and divide people over the past decade. They have to use pass the law and we move on. That's it. It was suburban areas like this that helped elect the CAQ last fall. Promises of a law on state secularism were a big part of the draw. Ahmad Ali, who's from Egypt, agrees with much of Bill 21, but says it shouldn't apply to teachers. My prophet is Catholic. He says he had a Catholic teacher in Egypt, and even though he is Muslim, their religious differences were never an issue. Many here say they want a secular law, but there are different ideas about what that should look like. Just take Constance Babin and Jean Couture. She supports the bill and says it's not about religion or race, but about separating church and state, even in the classroom. It's nothing to take off a headscarf to teach, she says, then put it back on for the rest of the day. But her husband disagrees. People could be shut out of jobs because they wear a veil or they wear a kippa, he says, and that bothers him. Francophones are are alone in 
uh, North America. So it's important to understand that we want to preserve our culture. William Paget says he worries about the tone of the ongoing debate. I think that people use the, this law to, to use racism against the people. He believes in a secular state, but like many here, he's torn about what kind of law should frame it. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Belle, Quebec. Okay, let's go down south. Shell shocked by scandal, numb to the bizarre. It's maybe a bit cliche to describe politics in the U.S. as reality TV, but the cast for the 2020 season is staggering. 17 Democrats have already launched presidential campaigns. Insiders, outsiders, progressives, centrists, big shots, long shots, and that's just those who've declared. But here's the thing. The candidate who's been leading in early polls against all of them, former Vice President Joe Biden. Now, he hasn't even officially entered yet. He is expected to, though, any day. But as Lindsey Duncombe explains, his most immediate fight is around accusations he's out of touch and that he perhaps touches too much all at once. In his first public statements after being accused of violating women's personal space, Joe Biden went for the punchline. I just want you to know I had permission to hug Lonnie. I mean, <laughs> we, we, we had the audience got the joke. Biden tried it again. By the way, he gave me permission to touch him. I... <laughs> but what amuses this crowd of unionized electrical workers may not play as well in the crowded Democratic primary for president. Out of nowhere, I feel Joe Biden put his hands on my shoulders, get up very close to me from behind, lean in, smell my hair, and then plant a slow kiss on the top of my head. The accusations of unwanted touching come from two women, forcing a discussion about behavior that is maybe not quite hashtag me too, but maybe not quite okay either. I shake hands, I hug people. In a video he released yeah, earlier this sure. week, Biden promised to do better. The boundaries of protecting personal space have been reset, and I get it, I get it. I hear what they're saying. He stopped short of a full apology, even when pressed by reporters today. I'm sorry I didn't understand more. I'm not sorry for any of my intentions. Women who worked closely with Biden have defended him as a champion of equality. Stephanie Carter, whose video with Biden went viral, this week called him a close friend, helping her get through a tough day. For many, the whole thing may be a chance to contemplate boundaries and behavior. Evidently not the U.S. president who has been accused of sexual assault by multiple women. Donald Trump tweeted this animation, writing, Welcome back, Joe. You gotta sort of smile a little bit, right? Biden was asked today if he runs, would there be more stories to emerge about his close contact with women? He said he wouldn't be surprised. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. Okay, in the off chance you feel like you've had enough of Brexit, wait till you hear about the flextension. <laughs> it's the latest twist in Britain's drawn-out attempt to leave the European Union. It's just an idea at the moment floated by the EU Council President, and it is in response to yet another appeal for more time from the British Prime Minister. But how much longer does anyone really want this to drag on? The CBC's Thomas Daigle explains it all for us tonight from London. Call it history in slow motion. This museum exhibition tells the Brexit story, reliving the referendum three years ago, all the emotion that came with it, and how little it solved. Nothing's changed. Like, we all still are extremely on edge. We're at a very tense point, and this is history. Brexit is history. Order! And this story looks to be going on even longer. Questions to the Prime With Minister. the Prime Minister caught in a Brexit Thank deadlock you, and reluctantly Speaker, asking April the opposition years. for help. But I think I'm right in saying that the leader of the opposition and I both want to ensure that we leave the European Union with a deal. Their closed door meetings appear stalled. We haven't ended the talks with the government yet. There's been no obvious move on the side of the government. So with the risk of a cliff edge a week away, Theresa May is forced to choose between a hard Brexit and another delay. This place shows no sign of agreeing to any deal. We should just leave the European Union because that's what 17.4 million people voted for. 
the European Council president is floating a plan he's calling a flextension. It would allow Britain to delay Brexit by up to a year or leave sooner if MPs here finally approve the prime minister's divorce deal. She's got other ideas. Today, May released this letter to the EU demanding the exit period should end on the 30th of June. It is frustrating, she writes, that we have not yet brought this process to a successful and orderly conclusion. If we can't find a way through with Parliament, then we have no choice, but it's not our first choice. European leaders have denied the British Prime Minister the extension she wanted before, and they could do it again. The story's still unfolding. Who knows for how much longer? Thomas Dagg, CBC News, London. There are some other developing stories we're following tonight, starting with an alert from Canada's public health agency about a salmonella outbreak involving six provinces and more than 60 confirmed cases. The source of the outbreak hasn't been identified, but officials say it appears to be ongoing. Illnesses continue to be reported. The bulk of the cases here in British Columbia with 23. However, there are at least 30 other confirmed cases in Alberta, Manitoba and Ontario. No food call recalls have yet been associated with this outbreak. It's huge news for almost 60,000 families living across the city who are going to see much needed renovations. Even as hecklers attempted to drown him out, Prime Minister Trudeau announced a $1.3 billion investment today aimed at repairing Toronto's crumbling community housing stock. The money's earmarked for the renovation of nearly 60,000 units, work that is scheduled to start this spring. The money, a combination of cash and loans, will be distributed over 10 years. And still ahead on The National, looking a gift horse in the mouth. Why cultural institutions are getting choosy about where they get their money. And adapting to climate change, we go in-depth with our panel of experts. Plus, a special day for a young man who was bullied while transitioning. I read your uh, story on yeah. CBC News and that was really inspirational. The start was kind of sharing my story because hiding who I am isn't going to help anybody, like even myself. His day with the Ottawa Senators. It's our moment. The Sacklers, those protesters were shouting about, is the family behind Purdue Pharma. It makes the painkiller OxyContin, which has contributed to North America's opioid addiction crisis. And New York's famed Guggenheim Museum is the target because it has taken Sackler family donations. Protests like that one may be paying off. The Guggenheim says it won't take any more Sackler money. And London's National Portrait Gallery turned down a big donation as well. But large cultural institutions, including those in Canada, need large financial gifts. So, as public scrutiny intensifies, how do galleries decide whose money to take? Deanna Sumanak Johnson explains. There are no protests like this in museums in Canada, at least not yet. But with so many of our galleries depending on private donors, the art world is watching the fallout from the Sackler controversy. It's something that um, all art foundations in Canada are very aware of and, and following with a lot of interest. There isn't much Sackler money in Canadian arts institutions. The Royal Ontario Museum received the largest of the lot, a one-time gift of $250,000 15 years ago. The ROM, along with some other institutions, declined our request for interviews. The Art Gallery of Ontario sent its gift acceptance policy, which says donations could be declined if the gift may have come from illegal activities or the gift involves sensitive issues. The National Gallery in Ottawa has similar policies in place. The fundraising arm of the gallery, its director and the board of trustees are all involved in vetting potential donors. You make the best decisions you can in the, in the current climate when the gift is made and then downstream sometimes uh, there's evolution to that story and certainly when it drifts towards criminal charges or very complex reputational issues, well then, then the organizations have to take stock and they have to assess what their next move is. The Sackler you know, family have done a lot of good. But for this prominent art philanthropist who sits on the Art Acquisition Committee of the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts, it's a slippery slope. Are we going to stop taking money from the banks because 
they egregiously overcharged or the interest rates on our credit cards are 22 percent. It raises a whole series of questions of is anybody, you know, is any corporate money any good? Because you're going to, right now in Canada, we have inadequate government funding for the arts. Why do you think but, that is? Whatever happens, Stephen Ranger, a partner at the auction house Waddington's, hopes it doesn't make donors reluctant to give. There's really only a handful of families who are, are big donors. If you took any one of those out, it would have a profound impact on our cultural landscape. And you're giving your friends a choice. For now, Canada's arts fundraisers are attempting a tricky balancing act, get the money they need for their institutions to shine, while also investing in policies to keep out the donors whose money just might not be worth the trouble. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead on the national, one year since the Humboldt bus crash. Tonight, how the team's pastors helping family and survivors wade through the grief. Also, this week, we got another warning that the effects of climate change are here and developing faster in Canada than in the rest of the world. We'll discuss how we adapt with our in-depth panel next. But first, Bianca Andreescu has been killing it on the courts. This Sunday, Canada's latest teen tennis sensation tells us how it feels to win and what's yet to come. Here's Adrian with a preview. Astounding Andreescu. She is 18 and you are looking at the future of tennis. Canada's Bianca Andreescu making history and headlines in months soaring from hard-working relative unknown to ranked 23rd in the world with brand new goals. Maybe crack the top 15 and um, do very well in the Grand Slams. So your coach doesn't quite know this yet? Well, we kind of spoke about it a bit here and there. Well, the Nationals for news anyway. It's might as well find out here. <laughs> exactly. Canada's court challenge, Sunday on the National. On The National tonight, we're keeping a close watch on several developing stories, including one involving disgraced comedian and actor Bill Cosby. Court documents show the 81-year-old in prison for a sexual assault has agreed to settle lawsuits filed by seven women. They accused him of sexual misconduct. Cosby called them liars, and the women sued him for defamation. But here's a twist. A representative for Cosby said the insurance firm settled without his knowledge or consent and says he will not pay anything. Rolling Stones frontman Mick Jagger is recovering tonight after having a heart valve replaced. The 75-year-old updated fans on social media saying he's feeling much better and is on the mend. The Stones postponed their tour last week so Jagger could get treatment. No matter how urgently you see the issue of climate change, this might have been a scary week for you. Canadians woke up on April 1st, no less, to a warning from federal scientists. This country is warming twice as fast as the rest of the world. Turns out, being a northern country, no joke. But also, in four provinces, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and New Brunswick, the federal government imposed a carbon tax. I'm not happy. We already pay too much. I feel like I feel it every time I need to fill up my car anyway. Gas in those provinces went up on average four and a half cents per liter. So no matter how you slice it, the reality of climate change is hitting just a little harder than it used to, which makes us ask, is this a turning point? And what is the path forward anyway? To help us answer some of those questions, three people who know an awful lot about the subject. Blair Feltney joining us, head of the Intact Center on Climate Adaptation at the University of Waterloo. We've got Catherine Abreu, Executive Director of Climate Action Network Canada. And Mark Cameron is Executive Director of Canadians for Clean Prosperity and a former policy director in Stephen Harper's government. So thanks to the three of you for joining us. And, and Catherine, I'll start with you just on that, that really basic question, right, of, of whether we are indeed at a turning point in terms of how 
urgently Canadians see the issue of climate change? Yeah, great question. I think 2018 was a turning point in a number of ways. Number one, we had that really pivotal report from the world scientists, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, in October of 2018 that solidified the science and I think sent a resounding message around the world and we see that Canadians do accept the science of climate change. They believe it's real. Right. We have also seen just this past week, as you've mentioned, the report on climate change in Canada. So Canadians who may otherwise have been thinking climate change is something that happens in somewhere, uh, some other parts of the world are seeing it's real here in Canada. Totally fair. I mean, but, but there is still a PR battle ahead, right? And, and I mean, you just look at the inertia to overcome this, this notion that I think a lot of people maybe legitimately have that, that we're just kind of along for the ride, right? That, that Canada, you look at the sum total of this country's emissions compared to, you know, China, the U.S., uh, Russia, India, Japan, we're down at the bottom of the list. I mean, how, how do you reconcile that? Well, I, I don't think Canada is actually that small. We're about the 10th largest emitter in the world, and we're the number one emitter among the OECD countries in per capita emissions. But the fact that Canada is relatively small doesn't mean that we don't have a role to play. We send troops to Afghanistan, even though on our own we could never bring about peace in Afghanistan. We send mm -hmm. 10 or $15 billion a year in aid to Africa, even though we know that we can't on our own solve international development. So we have a, a global responsibility, and we have to take that responsibility uh, internationally. That responsibility being to, to lead by example? Sure. There's, there's no way that developing countries like China or India, Indonesia, Brazil are going to act if they don't see developed countries like Canada acting, acting in first or at least at the same time. Climate change is irreversible. It is here to stay. We're not going backwards. Climate change has happened, is happening, and will continue to happen. However, uh, relative to emissions of greenhouse gases, we should do everything we can to slow down the rate of emissions, to slow down the rate of change. But then we also have to recognize that extremes in weather relative to flooding, fire, drought, hail, wherever you may be in the country, that is going to be the reality going forward, that those challenges are going to become more and more dire or challenging, and we have to step up in terms of adapting to these extreme weather events, and we need to do so rapidly. Right. Mark, you come at this from a unique perspective, because as I mentioned in the introduction, I mean, you were senior policy advisor to Stephen Harper. Um, what was it like trying to get climate issues on the front burner, and, and, and particularly in a government context? Because, again, just for context, I mean, Stephen Harper was a guy who, who wasn't exactly a fan of of the Kyoto Protocol. Well, the previous government didn't ratify the Kyoto Protocol. However, uh, the government did have uh, a, a commitment to climate change at both Copenhagen and Paris. The 30% reduction target were the targets that Stephen Harper introduced. Uh, Minister Jim Prentice and John Beard had the, the Turning the Corner plan, which was actually quite dramatic. It called for a $60 a ton carbon price by 2020. So, so there was uh, interest in, in the issue. It just unfortunately didn't go far enough. And we've seen many, you know, two steps forward, one step back right. on this issue. And, and there are always competing issues, though, right? And, and so I, I just wonder, was, was there a sense of frustration in, in, in the sense that you, you always want to do more? But, but those competing interests can get in the sure, way. Sure. The, the global financial crisis in 2008 really set back progress on climate change for a number of years. Uh, and, and now the cycle has come around again and climate change is back on the front burner. Carbon tax. It's one way forward. Uh, it, it, as I mentioned before, it's been imposed on, on four provinces most recently. Is it an effective way of tackling climate change, Kath? Yes, carbon pricing works, but it can't work alone. And that's why the Pan-Canadian Framework on Climate Change and Clean Growth lays out over 50 policies that work together to address climate change, help with adaptation, and to grow our clean economy. But for, for those holdout provinces, though, who believe that there ought to be a different way, right? And again, to reiterate, Ontario, New Brunswick, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, on who those, those carbon taxes were most recently imposed, I mean, their point of view would simply be that, that you know, we could perhaps tackle pollution at the, at the source, right, in terms of developing cleaner uh, sources of energy as opposed to taxing people, say, at the gas pumps. Is there virtue in, in that approach? I think so. I would not dismiss it. In other words, when you talk to those governments, they, they, they may not be big fans of a carbon tax or a cap-and-trade system, but I don't hear any of them saying that uh, that we don't believe that climate change is real and that we shouldn't work to reduce emissions. Right. They simply believe that there may be a, a, a better and or different mechanism to get there. 
Yeah, I mean, I think there's no question that economists will tell you that a carbon tax is the least cost, most effective way of reducing, uh, of reducing carbon emissions. And if you're not going to do a carbon price, and there are alternatives, you can do regulation, there are, other, there are other ways of dealing with it, but you have to lay out what your alternative is and what the costs are, because there are costs of regulation just as much as there's a cost to a carbon price. And the fact is, nobody likes a tax that's visible, whether it's the, the HST or a tax at the gas pumps. But if you don't have if you don't have visible tax, you're going to have hidden costs that are that are buried throughout the economy. You said something interesting there that that economists like the idea as an effective way of dealing with with the environment. Do environmentalists <laughs> and ecologists see the idea as, as being a particularly effective one? I mean, that's the, that's a question I posed to you earlier. I also wonder if there are other alternatives, other uh, better ways. We have plenty of evidence to show us that carbon pricing can work to drive down emissions. It doesn't hamstring the economy. It actually works to ensure that we're incorporating the costs of pollution because right now pollution's free. But it is absolutely the case that there are a variety of other ways to achieve those goals. We're unfortunately in a situation in Canada right now where the conversation around climate change has become highly partisanized and highly po uh, polarized. Climate change is not a partisan issue. It might be a political issue, but it is not a partisan one. And we have a long history of various governments of different political identities in Canada offering great solutions. So yes, there's a variety of ways to do it, but we have to make sure that everyone has a plan. But there's another part to climate change that we haven't talked about, and that's adaptation to climate right. change. Right. And when you go right across the country, I have not met a premier that wasn't on board in reference to adapting to climate change, to putting measures in place to lessen the risks associated with, with flooding that is getting worse or forest fires that are problematic. They're all on board on, on deploying best practices to take risk out of the system or anticipate that risk and prepare. What are the examples we should be looking to in terms of, of, of smart ways of adapting to the reality that, that climate is changing? In my opinion, I would hit the one that's most costly to Canadians right now, and that is treatable, practically and cost effectively, and that is flooding and flooding basements. That's the number one cost in the country as of this moment. Mm. And there are things people can do around their house uh, on a weekend uh, for a few hundred dollars that will be the difference in most cases between having perhaps a forty or fifty thousand dollar basement flood or not. And it's as simple as, for example, things like disconnecting the downspout from the ease trough system. If that goes into the ground, cut it off, put an elbow on direct water three meters from the foundation. Plastic covers over window wells so the water doesn't fill the window well, go into the basement. Check your sub pump to make sure it works, that it's not seized and so that when the water hits, it will pump the water out of the basement, it's ready to work. A few things like that around a house can be the difference between having a major flood in your basement versus not. That is highly doable and we should operationalize that as, as top priority. In terms of conveying the message that this is an urgent issue that is worthy of our attention and immediate action, I mean, what would you say? So I think Canadians are experiencing the impacts of climate change firsthand. The report that we had this week told us Canadian communities are experiencing floods, fires, melting of permafrost, as bad as many other communities in, in other parts of the world. From my perspective, the call to arms is really about talking to our elected officials, having a conversation about climate change, and pointing out that regardless of one's political identity, we experience the impacts of climate change, and we have uh, the conviction that it's necessary for us to take action. Two things. I, there's been a lot of talk over the last week, especially about the costs of, of carbon pricing. Not nearly enough focus on the benefits. Every Canadian is going, or at least in those four provinces, are going to be getting rebates this spring Spring, that for most households will be more than what they will actually pay in the carbon tax. And we have to focus on the fact that that revenue is not lost. That revenue goes back to the economy, back to households. Average household in Ontario getting $307 and in Saskatchewan about double that. Uh, it, secondly, what this report has showed is that climate change is not something for the far off future. It's not something that's going to only take place in Bangladesh or the Maldives. It's taking place in Canada. It's taking place now. And, and uh, we, we have to act now. It's a little bit like this. We're, we're heading, you're heading down the road in a little compact car in a certain direction at a certain speed. But you look in your rear view mirror and you see a giant transport truck coming up right behind you but at twice your speed. Moving in the right direction isn't good enough. You've got to speed up. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to do in Canada. That's the biggest mistake we're making right now is not moving fast enough. We're going in the right direction but we've got to go faster. Blair, Mark, Catherine, uh, wonderful chat. Thanks so much, guys. Thank For you. Sure. Thank you.
So, climate change has delivered nasty surprises. Oceans warming, ice vanishing ahead of projections. And while in Canada, the changes are more extreme, go to the northern parts of the country, like Inuvik, Northwest Territories, and the increasing warmth is impossible to ignore. Mackenzie Scott gives us a snapshot of how local residents and businesses are trying to keep ahead as their world melts around them. There used to be eight igloos here, but this is all that's left. This is our Aurora Igloo Village, or what was, I guess, <laughs> our village. Um, but it all melted and fell down, so you're just seeing the remains of all our hard work. It took Kyla Kasun Taylor and his team a month to build this ice village for their tours, but it melted a month early. Temperatures have been rising across the north at three times the rate of the rest of Canada, according to this week's climate report. It's scary, you know, like I really love the north and I love the winter and so many people depend on it. Um, you know, they're out there trapping or hunting. And then us with tourism, you know, we depend on, on, the, on the snow and ice. So it's concerning, yeah. In Yellowknife, the annual Snow King Festival closed a week early. And the Long John Jamboree moved from a melting frozen lake to land. This weekend, Inuvik's Muskrat Jamboree is expected to set up here on the Mackenzie River, like it has year after year. But it's unclear if that may change in the future. The last four months have been significantly warmer than previous years. In March, the average temperature was only minus 8, when the historical daily average was minus 22.3. Although temperatures have dropped to normal this past week, organizers for the Jamboree are taking precautions. People are being asked to park on land, not the ice road, to cut down on the weight. Noel Cockney from Tokta Yoktok is hoping people can still enjoy the festival season. Especially with the Inuvialo, it, uh, uh, like we've adapted to a lot of different changes, and that's just like basically what we have to do now. Although northerners are used to the unpredictability of the weather, most are worried about these warm temperatures becoming the new normal. Mackenzie Scott, CBC News, Inuvik. Next on The National, it's been one year since the deadly bus crash rocked Humboldt, Saskatchewan. Bonnie Allen speaks to the team pastor next. I can't dictate when a person should get over grieving. That's, you don't get over that, you know, but how do we move forward? Tomorrow marks one year since the Humboldt Broncos bus crash. The sudden high-speed collision claiming 16 lives and forever changing so many more. On that Friday night, the heartbreaking details slowly emerged. But we begin this hour with the breaking news out of Saskatchewan. The RCMP have confirmed a deadly crash involving a bus carrying a junior hockey team. A number of injuries have been reported as well. So much promise and potential was lost in those shattering moments. So much anguish haunted those who survived and all of their loved ones. The tragedy threw a community into mourning and grief echoed across this country. It's no wonder. The bright, eager faces of the victims can still make you ponder the lives they would have led. Through Humboldt's darkest days, some people in the community stepped forward to give voice to the despair and help people through their ordeal. Bonnie Allen caught up with one of them as the somber anniversary approached. In the small city of Humboldt, reminders of the Broncos hockey team and that catastrophic crash are ever present. A memorial sits outside the Humboldt Bible Church. Its pastor, Sean Brando, has been the hockey team's chaplain for eight years. I don't wake up having nightmares and things, but of course you think about it a lot. Brando wasn't on the bus, but he came upon the crash scene with his family. And just hear groaning and panic and fear. The 39-year-old pastor was thrust into the national spotlight after the crash in this televised vigil for the victims. That's all that went through my head. This is it. This is the valley of death. This is the valley of darkness. And all I saw was darkness. All I saw was hurt and anguish and fear and confusion. And I had nothing. Nothing. I'm a pastor. I'm supposed to have something. His raw anguish. I, I don't know why. I 
I don't know why. And questions resonated with a nation. Where was God? How could God allow this? Um, and that, that's really at the heart of it. And where was God in, in, in all of this? For him, it wasn't a crisis of faith, but he knew it could be for others. If God was a God that we could fully understand and could dictate what, what we thought should happen, this world would be in rough shape. If I, if I got my way every time, um, and, and if I tried to formulate a God that fit into a box of some sort, whatever I want him to be, he, he's no longer God anymore. Hope and humor are his salvation. At Saturday's memorial, the pastor will again search out the faces of 29 families grieving lives lost and lives shattered, survivors left paralyzed or coping with brain injuries. The families united yet unique. There's great strength to grieving collectively that way. There, there's great um, comfort in that, but at the same time, there's, it's hard to do and, and hard to keep doing. Grief, he says, is messy. You know, so where you have one person who's been able to move to forgiveness, another person can't, and so it, it creates the, an issue of, well, how, how dare you forgive that person? And then the other person says, well, how dare you be so behind in grieving? You know, and so it just presents some strain that, that isn't meant to happen in grief. The question of how to forgive the truck driver who blew through the stop sign keeps popping up, says Brando. And I don't think it's fair to ask me, should people forgive? I can't dictate that. But the Bible is really clear for those who have been forgiven by Jesus, we are called to forgive because we understand what it means to be forgiven. I can't dictate when a person should get over grieving. That's, you don't get over that, you know, but how do, we, how do we move forward? The much bigger thing, I think, is just that really hit people is the brevity of life. Like these are guys in their prime of life, strong, healthy, you know, and so that's a hard thing to swallow. His message now is one that he often shared with this team of young men. Some of us will have 20 years, you know, for some of these guys, some of them 16. Others are maybe live till 88 or 90 or 100, but we don't know. And, uh, and so just to take seriously the the breath that we have and to do well with, with the time that we have here on earth. Make the most of each breath, each moment. It can all be gone in a second. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Humboldt, Saskatchewan. The moment is next, but first, you may remember that last April people began leaving hockey sticks outside their front doors as a tribute to the Broncos players and staff who were killed. Back then, the idea spread on social media through hashtags like Sticks Out for Humboldt. And this year, it's happening again. The hockey community is so tight. I mean, uh, even myself this year at the University of Guelph, we had one guy this year who played a season for Humboldt and two more in the league who were on the bus that, uh, that April evening. As someone who came out of junior hockey recently, you know, I'm, I'm pretty familiar with the culture uh, just within that world, and then something like that shook up that world really, really at home to me. Some stories we run on the program resonate long after they've gone to air, and we have an example for you tonight. So you may remember Kian Olszewski, whose story of transition we brought you last month. Well, after it ran, there was an outpouring of support and one professional hockey referee in particular was especially touched by one particular part of the story. You see, after transitioning, Kean stopped playing hockey because he was bullied by teammates and coaches. And so this referee arranged a trip for Kean and his family to see and meet the Ottawa Senators. And that is our moment. He said, your league didn't support you and I want to show you that the biggest league in the world has your back. I read your uh, story on yeah. CBC News and that was, Really inspirational. I was, I was really, really proud of you. Nice to meet you. Yeah, yeah, you too. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we yeah. appreciate the support. Hiding who I am isn't going to help anybody, like even myself. I was going But definitely for other people in my position, like you need to kind of make it a normal thing, or else it's never going to get to that point. And the only way you can do that is by talking about it and just being honest. So I think we're heading in the right direction. Hey, 
No, it's really cool. I wasn't expecting like this much, you know. <laughs> I guess I wasn't expecting like kind of this much stuff to happen tonight. This, I would say, undid a lot of the stuff that happened to me in the past. So. T two things that I'm struck by there, Ian. One, he doesn't seem nervous at all meeting all those superstars. But the other thing is that there's so much good that, that people are, are ready and willing to do. Sometimes they just need the right connection, right? The right story, the right motivation to get them to do the, the kindest of things for a complete stranger. That's, that's pretty rare and that's pretty special. It tells us a lot, Andrew, about the moment uh, of time we're in right now, but it also says a lot about the Ottawa Senators. They, they, they didn't have to uh, go through, uh, you know, that, that uh, process. They certainly didn't have to allow cameras in for it. They chose to do it. They, you know, it was a remarkable thing they did, not just for him, but the whole issue. So uh, it was impressive, and it's a nice way to finish the week. That is the National for Friday, April the 5th. Good night. Good night.